In this lecture, we'll discuss recording and modeling mechanical interactions. The concept of doing this kind of recording has been well known in haptics for a number of years. Uh, about 20 years ago or so, Karen McLean came up with the idea of the haptic camera. The idea is that if you had an object in your environment, we all know about regular optical cameras that can take an image of it that you could capture and look at at a later time. But you could also think about haptic cameras uh, that would somehow capture how things feel so that you could then interact with that object through touch at a future point in time. There have been some other names for this haptic camera idea. Um, one is, is one that I use called reality-based modeling, the idea being that if you have a model for a virtual environment, you want to create that model based on data that you've taken from a real environment because that may feel more realistic. It may capture more information than something you would do from a simple physics-based model. And then Catherine Kuchenbecker has more recently been using the term haptography to replace photography, but with haptic information. And she's been particularly interested in how you capture information, sort of high frequency information, like textures or vibrations that you get from interacting with an object. But all of these ideas, whether that's the haptic camera, reality-based modeling, or haptography, all have to do with this idea of recording and modeling mechanical interactions that can eventually be used for a haptic display. The procedure for doing some kind of uh, modeling of this, tech, of this method um, is that you begin with a real object. You take that object and somehow you record data from it. Uh, when you have your HapKit set up properly, you'll actually be able to use the FSR on your HapKit to measure force information, and you can move your HapKit around while it contacts an object in order to record position information. You'll record all this data, and you'll have a data set. Um, maybe it will be, uh, you could think of it in a spreadsheet as having a column of times and a column of positions and a column of forces. And then that data will be analyzed and transformed in some way. You can't always necessarily take that spreadsheet of data and instantly be able to haptically render something, but you'll take that data and you'll create some kind of model or a lookup table that can be used in your code in order to use that data to generate a haptic rendering, which you would then be able to interact with using a haptic device. Now, when a person interacts with the haptic device, the forces and motions that are based on that model will be transmitted to a human user. Each stage of the modeling display process, going all this way from the start of a real object to something that the person feels, you can think of as acting as a filter where information about force-motion relationships are transformed in some way. Of course, what you would ideally like the human to feel is as if they are directly touching the real object, but instead the human is traveling through this complicated pathway all the way back to the real object, and what they feel through the haptic device may not really feel that much like the real object. But in, uh, in this week, our goal is to try to make the person feel something that's as realistic as possible by going through these steps and trying to avoid losing information as, as we pass through these filters. So let's look at these filters in more detail. Uh, the first part is just the process of acquiring the data. Um, if you want to do a good job at this, you need to have sensors with sufficient accuracy and precision. Um, we can certainly argue that the force sensitive resistor um, doesn't have that necessarily to do a really good job here, but the hope is that it's good enough to create something interesting. Um, in addition, it's not good enough just to have a nice sensor. You also have to have some sort of excitation of the system so you can record interesting object behaviors. So let's take, for example, um, the feeling of pressing on a button. I could take a force sensor and a position sensor and push on that button once, uh, but if I push on it at a different speed, I might get some different data. And so you might want to interact with an object in many different ways so that you can understand um, all of the variables that might be relevant in terms of the way it will react to different types of user inputs. The next step is to generate the model. Um, there's um, you know, no strict rule for this, but um, I've divided it into three categories. The first one is a, a database type model, where, like I said, if you have this spreadsheet of data, that you could essentially store the data in a lookup table. And it would say, if the user is at this position, then this is the force that you should display. However, there are also 
two examples which are more about developing true models. One is an empirical model where maybe you don't really understand the physics of what's going on. So you're pressing on this button and you have some data and you don't really know how to model that, say, with springs and dampers. But you do have a whole series of force displacement data and you might be able to just fit some parameters to it that aren't based on any physical reality. They're just, they're just a fit, kind of like how you calibrate it. You're, your, how you calibrate your FSR, your MR sensor. You don't have to know the underlying physics, you just do this calibration or fit. A physics-based model, on the other hand, means that you do under, understand something about the underlying physics of the situation. And so you usually start a priori with a physically meaningful model, and then when you fit the data, you identify the parameters of that model. And this would be the ideal both for educational purposes in this class, uh, because we would like to be understanding something about real physics, uh, but also because having physically meaningful models can be useful for optimizing your simulation or understanding why it feels the way it does. Uh, so ideally you would have a physics-based model, but if it's not possible, you could have an empirical model, and if even that's too difficult, you could go down to a database model. Now we look at the case of rendering the model, and depending on what type of model you've created, uh, you might have to render that differently. For a database model, let's take the example where you have a series of forces and positions. So let's say you have this lookup table, um, and you have forces, uh, uh, positions at say one, two, three, and you have forces there, and I'm just going to make it easy, I'm just going to have it correspond to the positions. But let's say these are in meters and these are in newtons. If you wanted to use this lookup table straight away in order to do a haptic rendering, you have to be a little careful because the person isn't necessarily going to be at the values of zero, one, two, and three. What if the person happens to be at a value of 0 0.5. Well then, what you might want to do is say, well, halfway, it's halfway in between these two x values, so let's find a similar value that's halfway in between these two force values, which would also happen to be 0 0.5 because of this simple example I've created. So this interpolation would allow you to make up data that's in between the data points that you actually have recorded. The empirical model and the physics-based model are a little bit different. Here, you've actually created a true model where you have a function describing the model. So a very simple example that I'll go into more detail in a minute would be if our model is f equals k times x. And in that case, um, let's say k is our data that we fit, and we can just write this function. A physics-based model would pretty much be the same thing. Um, the empirical model probably wouldn't have as much physical meaning as this, so this might be a best example of a physics-based model. Finally, it's important to know that as the haptic device and the human are interacting with each other, that even if you had some um, ideally perfect model that you wanted to render, that may not be what the human is feeling, and there's two reasons for that. One is that the capabilities of a haptic device, that is the accuracy of the haptic rendering, is going to be fundamentally limited. If you're asking for um, if information that changes too quickly, like forces that, that vibrate very quickly, and the, the dynamics of the haptic device and the speed of the Arduino code are such that, that it can't achieve those vibrations, well then obviously the haptic device is not going to output it and the human's not going to feel it. Another example is motor saturation. So let's just say, for example, you wanted to create a virtual spring. So again, if going back to our f equals kx, ideally you would have a virtual spring. The slope would be k, the stiffness of the spring. But it, let's say the motor saturates. That is, we don't have enough current for it, or it doesn't have enough ability to output torque, and then this just gets cut off. So what the user would feel is not the ideal spring that kind of keeps traveling up here, but rather something that just gets cut off, and, and that actually feels quite strange. Um, you can even try implementing this on purpose on your, on your hap kit and see how it feels. So the capabilities of the haptic device will of course limit the accuracy of your rendering. Of course, 
the capabilities of the human operator can also limit what the human feels. Uh, it's useful to, to think back to the very first week when we talked about the capabilities of, of humans in terms of their tactile and force sensing capabilities. And um, one point is it's not really necessary to render something on the haptic device to an accuracy that's beyond what a human can sense because they won't even notice it. But I do have to say that for the hap kit uh, in particular, the capabilities of the haptic device will usually be your limiting factor and not the capabilities of the human operator. But there are some haptic devices for which the capabilities of the human operator is the limiting factor. So I thought I would go through a couple examples of how this has been used in research, this idea of reality-based modeling, haptography, haptic camera, whatever you like to call it. Um, and in this case, we're going through these same steps, only now it's about recording information from real tissues in, in a medical simulation scenario, building complex tissue models, simplifying them, rendering them, and then giving feedback to a surgeon in, say, a training scenario. So I have two nice, very nice videos from researchers at the University of British Columbia, which were done with needle insertion. So this first video, you have a robot actually doing the recording of the data. It's pushing on this artificial tissue. A camera is looking at how it deforms. It's recording the motion of all of these little points in the image. Um, and it's doing it both by probing without inserting a needle and then also inserting a needle into the tissue. And it's building up this complex tissue model in order to be able to generate a haptic rendering of it. Now we can see the haptic rendering that's actually been created from that virtual model. So that same robot that was being used in the left video in order to acquire the data is now being used as a haptic device in order to generate force displacement relationships that the user can feel. And again, they're taking all of the points and deformation information that they recorded on the, with the real needle and generating a virtual environment that feels similarly realistic. Pretty cool, huh? Here's another example, this one from, uh, from my laboratory, where we did cutting with scissors. You can see I'm very interested in medical applications. In this example, we created this strange looking contraption where we put uh, artificial tissues, in this case there's a pic just a paper, in between some clamps, and we had a pair of robotic scissors which were caused to move and cut objects that were pulled across the clamp. And as this data was recorded, we recorded um, scissor angle during a single cut or multiple cuts um, and, and the force that occurs when that happened. So if you just close, open and close scissors with nothing in it at all, you still get an interesting force displacement relationship because of the inherent friction contact within the scissors. But we did this with uh, skin, liver, tendon, and some other organs. And you can see uh, that you would get different signals. And not only that, but the signals are somewhat complicated. They're very noisy. And in addition, you have an open loop here. So when you open and close the scissors, you, you get different types of signals. When you open the scissor, the force is very low. When you close the scissor, um, it, gets, it gets much higher. You can also see when you open the scissor, it's, it's low because it's, the scissors are trying to stay closed due to the friction, and then when you're trying to close the scissors over the object, the forces go positive. So let's see how we, how we, how we use, then use this in, in haptics. So over here now is a pair of haptic scissors. You can see that we removed the scissor blades, and now the handles are just attached to a drum, which is uh, connected to a motor pulley, very similar to your hap kit, only this uses that capstan drive configuration instead of a friction drive. And in this case, uh, we can get force feedback generated by this motor that tries to recreate these functions that were measured down here. And we created a graphical virtual environment in which this could happen. And now I'll show a video where you can see someone actually cutting in this virtual environment. So they're using this haptic device to move the scissors forward and actually cut through the virtual tissue. And uh, up here is some representation of um, the, the forces that the user feels as they cut, which again are based on these models. So another example of from beginning to end recording data from a real environment to create an interesting virtual environment. So let's do an example that's simpler and more like what, what you would do in this course. So we have our same process here that we just went through, 
The idea in this case is we want to model a spring. So let's say you have a real object, a real spring in the environment. And you could squeeze it um, either by um, hand with, with holding some, some force sensors and position sensors that could track your, your movement in space. Um, or you could, for example, take uh, your HapKit handle and push on it so that forces are measured through your FSR and positions are measured through the, the uh, magnetoresistive sensor. Then you would get some data. So you would get force and displacement information, and I'm going to plot it out like this. So you might get a bunch of force displacement data from pushing on this spring, and now you would want to come up with a model for it. Well, the first thing you could do is just fit a line to this data. Um, but we want to be a little careful when we're fitting these models. So you can see that this line, which seems to fit the data pretty well, um, doesn't cross the zero point here. Um, so there, even when x is zero, that is there's no displacement, there's some force. And ideally this wouldn't happen, but because there's some noise in the data, um, you might get something that doesn't cross zero where it should. And uh, it's up to you, actually, whether this is something you want to correct or not. But it might feel a little funny if um, the user's not even contacting the object and they feel a force. So what you might want to do is create a new fit, which constrains the line to pass through zero. And this is something that you can do in many plotting programs like Excel. And so you might find a line that fits like this. And overall, it doesn't look like it fits the data quite as well, but it does enforce that the spring um, has zero force when you have zero displacement. Now I'll note that these may not be the best fits. There might be some other nicer fit, which actually describes the data even better. But it is going to be our decision about how complex we want to make our model. Do we want to try to make a nonlinear spring to describe this, or does that not matter for our application? So we'll move on with the idea of creating a linear fit. And in this case, we have a linear fit, and we can measure um, the, the, the fit of this line is going to be characterized by its slope, k, and um, it has no y-intercept. And so our function that we would write on our code to display this model on the haptic device would just be our friendly old spring constant uh, law based on Hooke's law, f equals k times x. Finally, what you want is for the human operator to feel as if, they're, as if they're pushing on a real spring. So what you'll be doing in, in your lab activity this week is going through this process for a real object, and hopefully in the end, what you feel is very similar to the original object that you acquired data from. Some of the challenges to consider when you're doing this kind of modeling um, is that there is some nonlinearity in all real physical systems. So here's an example of the data that we had again, and the linear model wasn't so bad. <clears throat> and if you wanted to actually use data that was way out here, you would be assuming that the data would keep going that way. But it's quite possible that it would be nonlinear. And it might curve off like this. And so if you actually fit a linear spring model to it, but then you try to extrapolate and use that model at larger deflections, you might not be uh, reflecting the real world anymore. So just something to keep in mind, to be careful not to extrapolate far beyond the scenarios for which you recorded the data. Another potential issue, and this makes it just harder to program, is that a system can have hysteresis. That is, the system might not only be dependent on its current environment, but also on the past. So an example might be that, let's say, it could be forced displacement or some other variables, that um, as you um, sort of excite the system, let's say you push on a virtual spring, maybe your input-output relationship or your force display, your displacement to force relationship looks like this, and you go this way. And if this was um, a non-hysteretic environment, if you started going back the other way, you would just follow the same path. But a system that has hysteresis might follow a different path when it comes down. And this makes your coding more complicated, makes your programming difficult, because you have to keep track now if the user is on their way in or on the way back. And you have to deal with situations like, what if the user was on their way in, but then they stop here? Um, should we then come back this way?
or some other way. And so especially for systems that have a lot of hysteresis, you're going to want to take data at lots of different levels of input so that you can see how the system should respond when you come back. Limited capabilities of the haptic device, as already mentioned, uh, might make it difficult to render something truly realistic. So if you record data from an object that's extremely stiff and your hap kit um, can only put out um, either so much stiffness or the motor saturates, um, you're just not, it's not going to feel realistic. Sensitivity of the human operator we mentioned as well. And I think one of the most general and difficult things uh, to, to worry about in this kind of haptic rendering is that the human operator might interact with the simulation in an unanticipated way. If you recorded data for a certain scenario at a certain set of speeds, a certain amount of displacement, and that's what the user does when they interact with the virtual model, then it's probably going to feel pretty good. But you can't really control what the user does when they encounter a real haptic device. They might move faster, they might move slower. And if you haven't taken data or you haven't built a model that can understand how things should be different when the user behaves differently, then the simulation might not feel as realistic. Uh, and, and this is one of the biggest challenges of building medical simulators as well, because although there's um, only a few ways to do things the right way, there are many, many ways to do things the wrong way. And you would ideally like a medical simulator to, to show a person what would happen if they do something wrong. Uh, but because there are so many ways to do something wrong, it, it's difficult to simulate that.